Recently, I got laid off and wanted to take this as an opportunity to explore C++ roles. But I had one big problem, and that was that I don't have any C++ projects to showcase on my portfolio. So I figured, why not fix that? I came with the idea to make a simple bird simulation game. The game itself is very basic, you are just a bird that can roam around the terrain. But this project isn't really about what's on the surface, it's more about what's under the hood. Alongside the game, I built a standalone tool that allows you to create bird entities. And these generated birds can then be used directly into the game. The idea was to isolate the bird generation logic so non-technical users like artists or designers can generate birds without having any technical knowledge. I always like to create these kind of tools so developers can focus more on updating the tool and artists and designers can just work freely and not have to bother developers too much. And since I want to explore tools and system programming roles, I thought this would be a great opportunity to showcase some of those skills. At first I told myself, let's try and make this in 7 days. But, spoiler alert, it was a bit too ambitious for that. Because I wanted to highlight my core skills, I decided not to use any game engine or many frameworks. Instead, I went with OpenGL, which I hadn't used since my college days over 9 years ago, and on top of that I wanted to build the systems from scratch to really challenge myself. For the systems, I have a few I found important to implement, which are ECS, dependency injection, scene management, signals, and a custom console for logging. For the tooling, I chose There I'm Going, since this is widely used in C++ projects and a great library to get comfortable with. I use Google Tests for unit tests, and I use Premake for the project generations. This just as I find it very easy to operate. Since it had been a while since I used OpenGL for the last time, I first tried to focus to getting back up to speed again. And I must say, Tim Matrix's videos were a great help again. These also helped me a lot in college 9 years ago, and they still were really fun to watch today. After some getting used to, I had this boilerplate project where I just rendered this cube. But as you can see, this is such a mess. I mean, having the cube or coordinates right here isn't really that clean. So it was time to implement ECS. For those who don't know, ECS stands for Entity Component System. It's an architectural and structural design pattern that makes your system more flexible, modular, and easier to scale. For example, let's make a cube that contains a position, rotation, scale, and has the VEO and vertex count. But in this approach, all the data and logic is bundled together into one monolithic object. If I want to add, for example, in a capsule, I have to rewrite similar codes for all those values again, which is not ideal. With ECS you could build a more modular structure where both the cube and capsule are just entities. They each have their transform and the mesh component, and this way they share the same structure and can be accessed in the same way, by simply getting the component by its type. Let me show you an example from my early implementation. As I wanted to separate the cube rendering from the main application, I created an entity base class. This entity stores components which can be added either by type or by instance. It also provides methods to get the component, check if it has a component, or get the component only if it exists. At this stage the components were still pure ECS, just data with no logic inside them. Like here where we have the transform and the mesh which are then used for rendering. Combine this by making a cube entity and add all the data and pass it to the render system and voila, it's all working now and well structured. But I must confess that over time I transitioned to using behavior components which allows components to have logic. This is considered an anti-pattern in strict ECS since components should remain passive data containers. However, adding logic to components made the architecture feel more object-oriented, which in some cases made development faster and more intuitive for my use case. For example, so could I easily create this behavior component that follows a target and add it to my camera. That way the camera follows the player. Oh, and as you can see, I also built some tools around it. But this will come later, as I jumped ahead a little bit here. And as you could see, the player needed some way to access input controls. And therefore I used dependency injection. In most games there is a need for a structured way to access services and managers. A sort of locator pattern. Most popular approaches are singleton or service locator pattern, but I personally always like to use dependency injection. I also know that dependency injection can be hard to understand for some, so I do my best approach to try and explain. For those who don't know, dependency injection is a creational design pattern where objects receive dependencies they need from the outside rather than creating them internally. You bind interfaces to their concrete types in a container. When binding, you also define the lifetime, which controls how and when instances are created. A singleton, a single shared instance is created and reused. As transient, a new instance is created every time a type is resolved. Or as instance, an already created instance is provided to the container. Then, when you resolve the type from the container, it returns a corresponding implementation. This approach is very flexible. You can swap out implementations without changing the code that uses them. For example, say you have an iSafe service interface with both MacSafe service and the Windows Safe service implementation. 
When setting up the container, you simply bind the interface to the correct implementation based on the operation system. Anywhere in your game that needs to save will depend on iSafe servers, without needing to know which platform specific logic is underneath. This also makes your code more testable and more scalable because dependencies are clearly defined and centrally managed. How I implemented this in my code is as follows. I have a container, a lifetime and a bootstrapper to configure the bindings. My bindings are an input handler which is a singleton, a loader which is an instance and a player which is a transient. Now if I resolve a player, it will create a new player, it will create a new input handler as there is nothing catched and it will pass the loader instance that's already created. If I resolve another player, it will create a new player again and it will have the same input handler and the same instance for loading. Let me show you an example of my early implementation. As described, I created a lifetime enum and created the container I named DI container. In the container we bind the interfaces to their concrete types using a binding structure. This binding has a lifetime, a factory for the creation and has a catch instance for singleton usage. If we look at the bind method, you see we have to define the interface and its implementation. As arguments we define the lifetime and we can also pass an additional argument to pass to the constructor when creating an instance. When we bind the singleton, it will create a factory that will check whether theirs is a catch instance or not. If not, it will create a new instance and catch this. While for the transient factory, you will see it's always creating a new instance. For binding an instance, we have a separate method which creates a new binding with a factory that returns the already created instance. The resolve method looks for the binding by its type and invokes its factory. I also created the base bootstrapper, this is acting as a hub to set up and initialize bindings. As I was planning to use scenes, I find this quite ideal, as it allows binding based on scene context. Each bootstrapper has a container and can configure and initialize binding. Then in the main bootstrapper I bind the input manager to its interface, make it singleton and pass the window as an extra argument, as this also required to inject when constructing. I then catch the input manager in initialize, which then we used in constructing the camera. However, I must admit this is not ideal. It was much better to allow the bootstrapper to resolve. The camera relies on this input manager, so we inject it in its constructor, which is then used to move the camera around. Here, take a look. In a later stage I did correct myself and removed the initialization and added a resolve in the base bootstrapper. However, this still had one big flaw, which is that I had to call resolve on all bindings as extra arguments. This is where auto bindings come to shine, but more about that later. Now I only rest one important system I briefly shared at this point, which is scene management. With scene management we can control what's active and what's rendered when. The best example is having a main menu scene and a game scene. In the main menu scene we just show the UI to start and configure the game. And in the game scene we just load all the game entities and render the game world. In my implementation it is as follows. All my scenes are a registry of entities. This means that the scene is responsible for creating and managing the entities. And this also adds additional functionality such as getting all entities with a specific component. This way we can make a scene manager which controls all the scenes. So can it set scene A to active and unload scene B? Or set scene B active and unload scene A? Or it can even have both scenes active, so you can, for example, have a game scene and game UI scene active at the same time. Here's my implementation in the code. First I created the registry in my ECS system. This is just as I described. Although I must say I found this fault expression very interesting. This way C++ allows it to loop through all the entities only when it has the component. This way you can add multiple generic component types and if one is not matching it will ignore that entity. This is then used in rendering to find all the renderable entities. So this try get code can be changed as we are sure at this point we have the correct entity. The scene is a registry, each scene has its own loader for loading and unloading so it's isolated in the scene. And then we have the scene manager, which has a list of scenes and active scenes. All scenes are mapped by a string so they are easy to understand. In the application code I add all the scenes to the scene manager and then load the main menu scene. In the main menu scene I have no entities at this point, but I do render a button to unload this main menu scene and load the game scene. And in the game scene I do have a few entities to create the terrain and have a player and have a camera, but also render a back button to unload this game scene and load back to the main menu scene. If you run the code, it looks like this. As you now can see, at this point I also created this small inspector tool window. This is nothing too fancy. I created this eye inspector interface, an inspector window and created a scene inspector window. This scene inspector window will then find all entity components with an inspector interface. This way by adding eye inspector to any component it adds a new method which can be used to expose values. That way I can expose values to change them or just draw them as text to read the configurations. So with that one week has passed and this is what I got. Not really the goal I had in mind to do in the first week. 
Over the first week I realized that my layoff had more effect on me than I officially thought. I mean, one day was harder than the other, but although I was super motivated, it still had effect on my productivity. With that I realized it's better to give myself some more time, to loosen the pressure I put on myself. And also with that, I really want to say that if you're going through something similar like this, try to not overpressure yourself. And also embrace that some days are harder than the others. It's totally normal to feel lost sometimes in situations like this. So with that I gave myself one more week to get as much done as I'm capable of. And I started working on creating and planning the tools I had in mind. But first I had to solve a big issue I've been creating. And that's the fact that all the systems are in the game project. As I do not want to rewrite or duplicate all of my system codes to be able to reuse it for the tools project, it has to be split into libraries. By splitting them into libraries I can link them to my game and to the tool I'm about to make. If you are familiar with Unity 3D Engine, you can kind of think of this as assembly definitions. So we can isolate functionality and make dependencies. With that I adjusted my pre-make file, created a new project for the tool and made a function to generate library projects. This function is very convenient, so can I easily create new libraries as I develop and I don't need to repeat the same code over and over again. In this function you can pass arguments for the name, path to the solution, included and linked dependencies. For example, my dependency injection system, which I like to call simple DI, has no dependencies at all, but so do the scenes have multiple dependencies. Also, I do like to mention that as this project developed, I eventually also split up this pre-made codes into separate files. This way it was better organized instead of having it all in one large file. After all that, it was time to run pre-make to generate the new project. Oh, and I might have made this look easy, but it was actually quite a lot of work. I personally really like to do these refactorings. It exposes each dependency and thereby also cross dependencies. For example, my loader in rendering was dependent on ECS and ECS was dependent on rendering for the loader. So it was needed to isolate the loader from rendering by letting it return mesh data instead of returning mesh component instance. After all that, I just checked if the split dependencies were working by running the game and having an empty window for the tool. Now I had this all working, I focused deeply on creating the tool. At first I created a birch factory the idea behind this is to have a separate library which can generate birds based on JSON input. This way the tool can read and modify the JSON and pass it to generate the birds and these generated birds are then used within the game code. To do this I utilize nloman JSON to read this JSON file I created. This JSON can then run through the code generator, just generates all the birds with iBird interface and sets their values. Then it creates a registry which registers the birds and this registry will later be the main access point for the game to gather its data and it also creates a define header for convenience. When all the code is generated, the factory will automatically run the pre-make command. This to ensure a reload will occur and the project is reconstructed. See here the first result. After all this, I did several changes to this code generation and JSON usage. So did I use JSON everywhere, but later changed this to using order a JSON, as JSON orders based on their key first character value, and order a JSON orders based on the key index. This became very important when making the selection functionality later. Also, I created the validator code with a template JSON to first compare all key entries before running the tool. This way, new fields can be added to the template and these will then apply for all the birds that will generate after. And last I changed the code generator to generate the iBirds interface to ensure all the fields are used and the registry does not have a getter for each instance, but it just has a get instance and you can get all instance keys with the get all entries. This way it's a bit more generic. With the code generation working it was about time to start working on the user interface of the tool. But before that, one very, very important thing had to be done first, which is creating a 3D model of a bird. Because there is no bird simulation game without this pretty robin. And additionally I also added this goose 3D model to test some larger models as well. I split the UI into two views, one for the bird data and one for the controls. The bird data is a direct representation of the JSON. If a property value is an array object, I will render it as a collapsible tree. And for the OBG name and the texture values, I created this special case so it will render a drop down of all the values in a folder. This way it's always representing the files that can be used. When modifying the values, you can press save to apply, press delete to remove the entire entry, but watch out, I didn't add the warning pop-up. I really should have done that. And you can press reset to revert your changes. Then we have the controls panels, which has the generate button to pass the JSON to the factory some selection buttons to iterate through the birds, and added two quality of life controls to upload obj and texture files. At first I really wanted this to open native file directories, but I couldn't make this to work. So then I found out about this imgui file dialog and used that instead. Oh, and not to forget the add new bird button to add a new entry. 
Then to allow communication between the views, I created a signal handling system. Some also like to call this event handler, signal bus, event bus, message bus, or however, whatever bus you like to name it. I just like to call it signals. This works as follows. We have a signal handler and a signal. Any object who has a dependency to the signal handler can observe and invoke signals. This way, for example, object B and C observe a signal and object A invokes the signal. Both object B and C will then receive that signal without having any direct dependency to object A. This makes it very easy to create communications without having direct dependencies. Which, as you might can see from this video by now, I personally really like. In my code it works as follows. I have a signal which can be used to observe a struct. I have a signal handler which stores the observers. And then when observing a signal it creates an ID and adds this together with a function callback to the observer list. I return an observer handler which acts as an ID key for the observer so it can be removed when needed. For example this way if an object is deleted it can remove itself as an observer so it's not observing null pointers. Then in the invoke signal we create a new signal and look for all the observers of the signal and invoke the callback. This way the controls view can invoke a signal telling that the bird has changed and the bird data view and the bird entity to preview the model can observe to the signal to change its appearance based on the signal. And that way these bird selection controls work without having direct dependencies. With all these controls it's important to also have some way of visualizing feedback. So I created a custom console for logging and rendering this in a window. This way if the console is used for logging these logs are also displayed in the tool. I also added functionality in the forms of channels to have a prefix name and color the message to make it better organized. This makes it very convenient for giving direct feedback and makes the overall look much better. I hope I didn't make this look too easy, because it was quite a lot of work to make it all work properly and there were also additional challenges. For example, loading the goose model takes quite some time. So to make this more smoothly I made it run asynchronously, but for the binding the VO in OpenGL it must also run on the main thread. Therefore I added this util which acts as an additional layer which can be used asynchronously but ensures it's run on the main thread. And to add even more feedback I also created this simple loading screen. With all that the tool was finally finished and the implementation to the game was also relatively easy. I just copied some of the code I used for the bird selection in the tool and transformed that to the, to the game. Not something that I'm really proud of, but hey it did the job. With that I just had to tweak some of the system so it would work with the bird that's just selected. But at this stage the project was as good as finished. I mean at least to use it for my portfolio. This is the tool and the game were working neatly together and that's all what I wanted to showcase. I then spent some more time on doing some cleanups and adding some comments and doing some documentation. However there was still one thing that kept bothering me. And that was that my dependency injection system did not have auto binding. So after some days of struggling with this that it's not working I thought yeah, I will just implement it. So here's an explanation of how I did it. Within dependency injection systems, it's commonly used to auto-inject all dependencies when resolving an interface. So let's say I have an interface with its implementation. And just for clarity, let's call them interface and implementation A. The implementation is dependent on interface B and C as well. For this to work, you then need to bind interface A, B and C to their corresponding implementation. Then if you resolve interface A, it will also resolve interface B and C during the creation of implementation A. In my code, this works as follows. I now added these constructed traits, this way we can define the dependencies of our implementations. In the container we then look for the constructed traits of the type we are trying to bind. And then we add a resolve for each dependency to its factory. As addition to this I also added that you can link other containers as well, just in case you have multiple containers active like I have with my main and game. Now in the bootstrapper you don't need to have extra arguments. You just need to resolve the type and you need to define the type into their constructed traits as well. This really worked like a charm for me. So that was finally it. Although there's more to it, so that I also made some unit tests and stuff I didn't really cover in here and probably also some other tiny details. So if you're interested in those, you can also check the link down below to go to the repository of the project. I now hope this project can help me explore some C++ roles, but if not, I also really had some fun doing this. And also, I really hope that you enjoyed this video and maybe learned something from it as well. If you did, feel free to subscribe because I might share some more game development content soon. But for now, as always, happy coding.